Thursday. <laughs> she like to share. <laughs> I guess he. Uh, it really, it's quite funny actually because um, what I'm, I'm chairing, but I, on the basis that I, I think the chair's privilege to, to say a few words for whatever she says, the, the presentation she's given. <laughs> oh really? Into traffic light system, so you have to do it the old-fashioned way with a watch. I'm, sh I'm sure you're up to that. Well, the yellow people. Yeah. So I phone them. I'm not sure it's going to make it here to remove yes. the panel to... Well, you can turn it over to the lady now, and please uh, speak to the person that's behind you. Okay, cool. And then you're doing the next thing in this switch. Okay. Um, I'm just looking on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for the name. Yeah, half frozen. Yeah, I'm just No, I wasn't there. Hello. 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 It is, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to pop my store. I'll leave you in charge. You're very capable of And who's in charge of this? Oh, yeah. 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 They should be, yeah. Gennaro uh, is in charge of the AV. Uh, the company does it. It's a clean one. Fabulous. Um, make sure of it, but I understand that it will probably have to be put through it, but I'm uh, sure it will be. all questions which you've all finished rather than after each presentation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See each other. You are that mark to go early. <laughs> Good. Okay. Go for it. Right, good afternoon everybody. Welcome back. 
Um, my name is David Tudor from the Crown Estate, uh, Marine Portfolio Manager. Uh, we've got a fun-packed and interesting afternoon ahead of us on wind and tidal. We have, uh, well, we have four speakers, three of them are here. We've got one to come later on. Um, we'll start off with uh, Gordon Edge from Renewable UK and Emma Roberts, Chief Executive of NRW and Mark Hoyer, Managing Director of Made Bridge. It'll cover the real breadth of uh, the offshore and onshore wind, tidal, which we've got from policy, EMR, electricity market reform, talking about regulation, advice, um, enabling sustainable development, talking about the supply chain, and then of course talking about um, an interesting development in Swansea. So I think we should start. So please, Gordon Edge is first. Gordon's Director of Policy at uh, Renewable UK. Gordon's been with them for quite some time, over 10 years, a lot of experience in this sector. So over to you, Gordon. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm really glad they turned the lights on in here. Makes my prime job, just keeping you awake in the post-lunch lull, that bit easier. So, um, that's me. I'm talking about electricity market reform, but what I'm really going to talk about is what the, the real limiting resor limited resource in all of this, which is money. There's a budget, and it only goes so far. Now, there is some good news from the election result. Yes, there is some. Uh, and that is that there is some policy stability in all of this. They're not going to come in there, rip up the whole EMR structure and start again, which is great because I spent the last five years messing around with that and I don't want to go there again. So that's, that's good. The bad news is that there is stability in the policy <laughs> the arena. And it means all the problems that we, we had before, we still have them now. And number one, the levy control framework budget. It's going to limit deployment. It will limit deployment. It is limiting deployment. The buying power of this budget is very uncertain. And I'm going to spend most of my time in this talk to walking you through why what looks like a very large amount of money doesn't give us as much confidence as you might hope. And there are still remaining issues with the CFD allocation, um, the architecture of it, and, and some of the contract terms. It's a bit of a second order issue, but they're still out there. So before I start, you know, what is the levy control framework? I think it's kind of got a little bit under the radar, because it's, it's, it, it's got a really, a really dull name, levy control framework, a bit of an accounting measure, you know, but it's vitally important is agreement between Treasury and DEC, which says to DEC, you can take this amount of money out of people's bills to pay for the low carbon agenda and no more. So it covers all of the, the three main policy measures, the CFD, the RO, and the small scale feeding tariff. Uh, and that includes the FIDE contracts under the CFD. So all of that has to be paid for out of the money that's, that's set aside. Uh, and it goes from where it is now, uh, which is about Four billion to 7.6 billion in in 2020 in 2011-12 money, so it rises um, uh, with inflation. Not that there's much of that at the minute. Um, and the idea is, it was supposedly designed. That amount of money was supposed to be ample for delivering the, our 2020 renewable objectives, as set out in the in the 2020 uh, directive for renewables, but also other low carbon objectives. So everything that's paid for with the CFD is not just renewables. If they were to give a CFD for a CCS plant, for instance, that would also have to be paid for under the levy control framework. So um, here's a very busy table, but it sets out what government thinks is left in the pot. Uh, yeah, great, I've got, okay, let's see. Uh, along the top, um, the, the, the 7.6 billion is not just, you know, 7.6 billion, it, it's a rising number each year. So there's a, a, an upper limit for each year, which goes up. Um, there's stuff that's been committed to already. You know, there's so many things have got the feed-in tariff or the RO. So you have to, you have to budget for those. Um, this, by the way, was a, a table that was published by DEC in November with the annual energy statement, uh, <coughs> plus some additions we, we, I'll come back to. And they've accounted for growth in the feed-in tariff um, some more people coming into the RO before it closes in 2017. Um, the FIDER contracts uh, go up to you know, about a billion pounds, but over a billion by 2020. Uh, and we've added in the C what the actual result of the, the CFD round one. 
So he starts very low, uh, goes up very high towards the end of the decade. Um, this bit of money needs to be paid over to the low carbon contracts company to administer all of this stuff. Uh, what does that leave us with? These numbers here, nice billion, nice nearly around billion quid in 2020. Loads of money, billion pounds. That's surely going to be plenty for all the things we're going to do additionally between now and 2020. Uh, don't you believe it? Now, to explain why there might be some problems, you have to start thinking about what's the dynamic of affordability with the CFD. Now, this graph shows you what you could afford in terms of megawatts um, with the same amount of money, which in this case is 54.6 million, which is about what offshore, onshore wind got out of uh, the first round of allocation, uh, against the difference between the reference price and the strike price. Now, this is the, 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 the key thing about the CFD, is it, it's a variable top-up between a market reference price uh, and the strike price. If the reference price is low, then the top-up is high, and the affordability goes down, so you can buy less megawatt hours of the money, and vice versa. So, this bit here is about what the result actually was. Difference of about 31 pounds, we got 748 megawatts was the actual result. So, um, if that difference goes down, say the reference price goes up, then the amount of megawatts you can get goes up. So, you know, if it was 10 pounds less, you'd have 1,100 megawatts. And of course, it keeps going up. And if we got to the wonderful point of zero difference, we'd get an infinite amount of onshore wind. Wouldn't that be great? Of course, it works the other way. If the difference goes up, then we can afford less and less. So you had another five pounds down here, then you'd be getting barely 600 megawatts, maybe a bit less. Another key thing to note, look at this load factor. That was the set load factor in the allocation framework. It was the number that, that National Grid used when valuing uh, projects coming forward. I don't think many new projects would get going at a load factor of 26.7%. What if it was 30%? and therefore each megawatt produced more megawatt hours and therefore used more budget. Immediately, your, the, the number of megawatts you get goes down. So for the same 31 megawatt difference, you're you know, 670, 80 odd megawatts less and the same dynamics apply. So these are key things that you need to account for, the difference between strike price and reference price and the load factor that's used. So let's look at the dynamics that those, those impose on the overall budget. Um, by the way, here's, here's, some, here's, here's the reference price as DEC set out in April 2014 and when it was doing the first uh, cut of the, of the CFD allocation round budget. And then in October, it published other ones uh, and it was like about £10 less across the board. So in that intervening time, DEC's future estimate of what reference price was going to be went down. And therefore, you looked at the curve, the affordability goes down too. Here's some base case load factors that were in the allocation framework. Here's something that looks a bit more realistic, you know, 30% or 45% or for offshore instead of 37.7%. Look at the FIDE budget, the use of budget by the FIDE contracts. If you use the 2014 reference price, use this much, use the October reference price, it's that much. And if you add in the real uh, load factors, you're massively higher than you thought you were only a few months previously. Similarly with the round one CFD budget use. You have increased amounts of budget use because of all of those factors. And indeed the RO, if you, if you assume 26.7% load factor for new stuff in there, um, if you use a 30% one, you're saying, well, actually, um, we're going to need to budget more for the same megawatts coming through in the RO. Add all of that up, you've gone from, you know, okay, we thought it was 1,200, you know, uh, left in the, in the budget then, gone down to about a billion, but even then we're down to maybe 800,000, 800 million in all of that. That's you know, left in the pot, so we've eaten away at it already. Now this, 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 um, this slide is called the elephants in the room because DEC also has an awful lot of discretion to sign contracts with whoever it likes um, for you know, its own purposes. And there are lots of different things it could be signing these contracts with, and here are, here are some of them. Um, Tidal Lagoon, we, we'll hear about more about that later, hopefully. Um, 
that's going to need maybe 60, about 60 million quid, depends on, you know, that's making an assumption about the strike price and, and low taxes and so on, which is, you know, it's an amount of money, not that much, so I'm not too worried about it, but it's, you know, they could sign one of those and it'll take some money. Um, Hinkley C, big one, won't come out of the 7.6 billion because it's being delivered in 2023 or sometime. Um, but if it's, if, if these things, if these taxes are all as we think they are, that's nearly a billion pounds you need to account for for a nuclear power plant. Okay, maybe we don't have that, but maybe we will have one of the, one or two of the CCS plants in the, in the original uh, competition they've got. 150 million each, maybe 300, depending on strike prices and so on. Um, load factors, that's still quite a chunky amount when you've only got a few hundred million left. Um, there are the decisions that the government has in terms of allocation uh, within the allocation rounds. There is a pot three for biomass conversion. One unit of Drax, 170, 180 million pounds. Again, if you've got 800 million left, that's nearly a quarter of it. Um, what about the onshore wind projects in, in the Scottish islands that are 115 pounds a megawatt each? 400 megawatts of that is nearly 100 million. And all of these are uncertainties. We don't know which uh, any or all or none of these are actually going to come through. That's not where it stops. The bad news keeps coming. Um, that's all the stuff I was talking about before. But look, in the RO, they could get it wrong in terms of what, what comes forward under the RO because they can't control what comes in, what, what gets built under the RO because it's open access. Um, they, uh, in a recent consultation, they admitted they thought uh, they, there was a unit, uh, a, a conversion unit they weren't expecting. They thought would come through under the RO. You know, so maybe they got their RO estimates wrong by a couple of hundred million. Or, or maybe they've got the, the different projects that could come through under the RO, maybe they got one of those wrong, so maybe there's, there's a downward uh, uh, adjustment. The other things in here, fortunately though, uh, are actually all downward potential adjustments. Um, there is a capacity adjustment in the CFD, you can adjust down the capacity that what you want to, to build at, at the FID point. Um, there are various other attritions that you might expect from FID E or, or, or the first allocation round. But it does introduce yet more uncertainty into how much money is left and how much you, it's, it's, it can buy you uh, at the end of the day. So what does all of that mean? I've thrown a lot of graphs at you. And I've said a lot of different things and I've said there's, there's an awful lot of uncertainty there. What does that, what does that tell me? Um, is this new government going to be willing to revisit that levy control framework settlement? Um, we could be missing the renewable target. Maybe there isn't enough money to bring forward enough renewable generation to meet the requirement required under the renewables target. Hmm? Sounds a bit unlikely. Um, mind you, if one of the reasons we're going to miss it is because contract for difference eating more money because the wholesale price is low, means that consumers are paying less. So maybe they could afford a bit more being taken out through the levy control framework because they're paying less for the wholesale price of power. So maybe it's not so fanciful as, as it might seem. Um, there is an option to have some, some, some headroom in that. That's meant to account for things like what if there's a, 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 a sudden trough in power prices and it comes back up again so you have an overspend or you have an exceptionally windy year and there's lots more rocks and, and CFD um, megawatt hours on the system and therefore you, you overspend. Will it be tolerated you know, um, on a more ongoing basis? They might, they have a bit of lee room, leeway that they might do that. Um, but then what about the shortfalls that we're expecting in the other bits of the renewables target? Because remember the renewables target is an overall energy target of 15%. And they said, well, we think it's about a third of electricity should be electricity share, but we want 12% of heat and 10% of transport to be renewables. And we're miles behind on those. Um, for heat itself, I've seen one estimate that says on current trends, we're going to be 19 terawatt hours short uh, on, on the heat side. And that's equivalent to about seven gigawatts of onshore wind if, if you wanted to fill the hole with onshore wind. Yet to be seen what government is going to do about these potential shortfalls. Are they going to go back to Brussels and say, we're not going to do it, tough. Or are they actually going to take it seriously um, uh, and actually on the basis that, well, there's going to be major fines here, we ought to do something about it. 
and they haven't got many options. And they need to tell us in the, in the electricity sector that we need to do more if we're going to do enough in time for 2020. I think one of the main things that could be really good out of all of this is if that limited budget focuses government's mind on the key decisions it's got. Does it really want to put money in pot three and have biomass conversions? What value does that bring to the UK economy, just shipping in loads of chip and pellet from the southern United States and burning it in tracks? Huh? That's not really strategically going to give us a lot of benefits. So maybe actually they just zero that one out and say, actually, we do want to do more offshore wind because actually that gives us an industry. Um, if, they, if they kind of focus on those decisions and actually come the right way, that'd be great. Um, on the other hand, um, at the moment, we've got, we seem to be on course for a good, a good 10 gigawatts of, of onshore wind, uh, sorry, offshore wind. Um, if there are a couple more projects come through under the RO, we'll be reaching nearly 11. Maybe they go, well, actually, we don't need to give out any more CFDs for offshore wind because um, we've met our 2020 objectives. Um, we'll, we'll just take a holiday on that one. That would be very damaging um, for, for, uh, for the offshore wind sector's confidence. I'm not see. I'm nearly done. Um, and then at a bigger scale, might government be willing to revisit how the levy control framework is accounted for? Because <coughs> well, a lot of the problem comes from this variable top up between the reference price and the strike price. What if you took a naught to strike price view? Because that's ultimately what the consumer is paying. Uh, it makes it look a lot bigger, but it gives you a lot more certainty because the money doesn't, there isn't this uncertainty around, uh, around what the reference price is. Um, again, are they possibly going to do that? Um, I'll, I'll skip through this. This is the kind of unfinished business around allocation uh, and, and terms. Um, well, we've talked a lot about well, commitments on the shore wind, so I'm not going to talk about that. That bit really has the stuff that's, that's changed. There may be some changes to RO and CFD eligibility. Um, clusters, no, I won't go into that because that's going to take far too long, but if anybody's interested, Mid-Wales is a key example of, of you know, having lots of projects all dependent piece of grid depending on all these projects happening and if you've got a CFD competition and they aren't all assured of support, how do you justify the grid? Uh, and then there are some refinements around the CFD allocation terms. Um, for instance, the milestone delivery date at 12 months just doesn't work for offshore wind. So we're going to going back to, to government saying, come on, guys. Uh, and just finally, um, a bit of good news. Um, the levy control framework budget could be a really good tool for promoting certainty and, and foresight and all this. If the government wants to give us that, and I'm, um, I'm going to tell my favourite light bulb joke here, um, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Just the one, but the light bulb has got to really want to change. And the government really has to want to give us that certainty because if it sets out budgets going forward for allocation rounds, it gives us a timetable for those rounds and an and indication of the budget and gives us further thought on, on what the levy control framework will be post-2020, excellent tool potentially for giving us all the kind of certainty we need. But they've got to want to give it to us, uh, particularly if you have like rolling horizons on various things. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, I should have said at the beginning of this, we're going to take questions to the panel once everybody has spoken. Um, so next, we have Emma Roberts. I'm uh, Chief Executive of Natural Resources Wales. Emma has worked in government in a number of senior roles. He joined um, NRW at its inception. And uh, over to you, Emma. Okay, David Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you here today about the work of Natural Resources Wales. Uh, can you let me... Slides to work. Forward. Just do forward, is it? Just forward, yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I'd just like to spend a little time just telling you about Natural Resources Wales, how we work with business and how we'd like to work with business in the future, and some of the issues um, that lie ahead, but also some of the opportunities that there is for us in renewable energies uh, in, in, in Wales. So um, I guess most people in the room know that Natural Resources Wales um, has, uh, is a new organisation. It's picked up the functions of the old Environment Agency, the Countryside Council, the Forestry Commission in Wales, together with, and very importantly, 
the marine licensing and other licensing functions from the Welsh Government. So bring them together into one organisation. We've been going just over two years. We're the largest sponsored body in Wales. We have about 1,900 staff. Uh, and we manage uh, about 7% of the land area uh, of Wales. Total budget around 180 million, of which almost half is made up of charges and fees. Um, we also um, have, uh, we also sell timber, uh, so that generates about 16, 17 million pounds a year. Um, we have a ring fence allocation uh, on flood risk management, and then we also get granting aid from, 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 from the Welsh Government. We think we're the only organisation in the world with this mix of activities. And energy and responding to climate change and sustainability is at the heart of, of what we do. We have a number of specific functions, um, and it's really important to know what functions we're adopting if we're in discussions with business or with public bodies or with uh, in, in, in individuals. We interact with a lot of organisations in particular sectors or in particular dimensions. Um, it's still, people find it difficult, I think, to understand truly the breadth of what we do. Um, but I've just picked out some of the areas which are particularly relevant to uh, wind and, 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 and tidal. So we are regulators. We are the main environmental regulator uh, here in Wales. We protect people and the environment by ensuring that businesses and individuals operate within the law and when their actions uh, impact on the environment. So we issue things like environmental permits and licenses, and we ensure compliance against that. We monitor against those, uh, those, those, those standards. We're also a statutory consultee, so on planning applications. Uh, so we provide advice to decision makers on how a development might uh, affect the environment. So we advise local authorities, um, PINs uh, on, uh, on planning applications, and they could go from the, the very large, uh, you know, suppose Bay Tidal Lagoon, current, current point, um, through to individual housing developments on floodplains, for instance. We receive about 9,000 planning applications a year to, to, to consider. We are also landowners and managers, and this is, if you like, the unusual ingredient, I think, in our powers. We manage the Welsh Government uh, uh, estate, primarily the forestry estate, uh, on behalf of the Welsh Government, so it's the old sort of Forestry Commission functions there. But that, that means that we work together with developers in terms of projects on, on that land. Uh, we also manage other uh, land as well, um, nature reserves, uh, flood assets, uh, and things like that. Um, we also sell timber, obviously, from, uh, from, from, from that land. We manage recreation areas. And you may have also seen us in terms of responding to environmental incidents. So not last winter, the winter before, in terms of the flooding uh, responsibilities we had, we, that was pretty high profile and important work for, for, for us. So I say, really important that we, um, people recognize that we have all these functions. And within the uh, NRW, we are very clear about which part of NRW is dealing with which. So our commercial activities, for instance, are separate, kept separate from our licensing and permitting of our planning uh, uh, responsibilities as well. So it's really important for us, and we're very transparent in the way that we actually handle that. So in terms of the, uh, the growing challenges that we have, um, we see climate change and energy as being one of the biggest challenges facing Wales. Of course, the two things are in inextricably linked. Two-thirds of our emissions come from the energy that we use, and decisions on one field cannot be taken uh, without considering the other one. Climate change is also affecting biodiversity, and there's also plenty of evidence that climate change is affecting biodiversity. And according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, climate change is likely to become the most significant driver for biodiversity loss by the end of this century. Uh, another big challenge for us is, is resource efficiency, which use it, it means uh, using the Earth's limited resources in a sustainable uh, way, minimizing impacts on the, on the environment. And I think particularly pertinent to us in Wales is economic and social inequality. Even in a population of three million, um, there are huge differences in uh, quality of life, life expectancy, economic prospects between different parts of Wales. And one of the unique um, but troubling, I guess, issues with Wales is that we have um, opportunities for the environment, some world-class environment, very close to some of the most deprived areas that we have in Wales. 
So, you know, Gwynta Ford is adjacent to Rhyl, which I think is the most deprived community in, in, in Wales. Uh, Swansea Bay um, Tidal Lagoon is, is close to some deprived uh, areas there. Um, and Penicamoyth uh, adjacent to Port Talbot. So, you know, again, renewable energy is, I think, inextricably linked with social and economic outcomes as well. These are all long-term issues which require long-term solutions. Uh, yep, the, uh, the new Environment Bill, which was laid uh, last week in the, in the Assembly, requires Welsh ministers to meet climate change uh, targets. So the key target is to ensure that, w that net Welsh emissions by the year 2050 is at least 80% lower than the baseline. And climate change targets are now part of uh, that legislation. And I think we all acknowledge that renewable energy is crucial in addressing this. So unless we act now to face these environmental and social <coughs> and economic uh, challenges, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to move ahead in, in, in the future. Now, um, the programme for government with, with Welsh Government had a number of commitments in there in terms of how we manage our natural resources in a sustainable way. And these have been enacted through various pieces of uh, legislation. And the evidence has been clear for some time that um, the, uh, the state of the UK, UK ecosystems is showing declining ecosystem services as well as declines in biodiversity. Um, and in order to tackle this, and the whole point behind creating Natural Resources Wales is that we respond to this in a joined up way, in a coherent way. Hence drawing together these different functions within Natural Resources Wales so that you know, we don't have separate public bodies dealing with elements of them. And this process started back in 2010 and Jane Davidson had chaired one of the morning sessions. She was perhaps one of the main architects behind this move towards a joint, joint up approach. And unlike in England, the environment and environmental legislation has been a really important part of the Welsh Government's programme for, 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 for government. Let's say um, the NRW is part of that, that, move, that move forward. So what does sustainable management of natural resources mean? It means things like uh, adaptive management. It's about planning, monitoring and reviewing action not setting a fixed course, but we're willing to make changes based on the evidence to improve outcomes. It means acting at an appropriate scale. It means that some things can't be tackled at a local or site-based level, and that's usually a symptom of a service failure, or system failure, rather. Uh, we need to address the causes of those symptoms rather than to treat them, which is uh, you know, unsustainable. It means co-production. It means working collaboratively and engaging with a diverse range of stakeholders so that we develop solutions to problems together and not just uh, bring ready-made solutions or our own baggage to the table. Everything needs to be evidence-based, informing and in shaping decisions, but also to actually identify and confront those areas that we don't know enough about, we haven't got sufficient evidence uh, about. And it's all about long-term thinking, uh, as, as uh, explained in the... Uh, uh, well-being and future generations bill it's about the consideration of the benefits of ecosystems and uh, that's that's a really fundamental approach and um i, I don't know how many w w were next door for the morning session but i can only really concur with what richard cowell was saying in terms of we need a better spatial and ecological attunement was the phrase that he used in terms of actually linking these things together and under the environment bill um, natural resources wales will have an important function to play we need to create what we're calling area statements. Now, they will be a statement of the current position regarding the environment for each part of Wales, but also the opportunities that, that rest in those areas for further development. So renewable energy will be part of those, um, uh, uh, those area statements, as well as you know, the conservation needs, uh, land use needs, and, 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 and so on. So I think we are moving forward with this, with this joined, joined up agenda. Uh, and in terms of resilience, um, I think all the evidence is that, generally speaking, the greater the diversity of species within an ecosystem, the more resilient it is. Um, again, the bigger the ecosystem extends, the more resilient it can be. Ecosystems need to be in a healthy condition to eff function effectively. And we know that well-connected habitats and ecosystems promote uh, a, better, a better environment uh, to promote movements of species and able to respond to 
climatic factors. I won't dwell on this, um, but as, um, uh, as Jeremy said this, this, this morning, the Welsh Government is, uh, is putting a marker up that it believes that uh, renewable energy in particular is, 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 is really important. It's brought out this, uh, th this statement, and it is trying to create what Audrey Morgan described as clear red water between Wales and what's happening in, in England. Natural Resources Wales is part of Team Wales um, in, in, in this respect, and certainly we are given very in, um, encouragement by our minister to actually engage in, in, in this. Okay, so what does this mean in, in practice for us? Um, as I said, one of the roles that we play is that we are a, an important land manager in Wales, and uh, we work, and we're very proud to be working, in terms of the delivery of onshore wind and other uh, uh, energy projects on the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. And our energy delivery programme works with uh, developers uh, on, on a number of projects. Um, the current position is that uh, Vattenfall's Penacomoid wind energy project is in its construction phase. Uh, more than 40 turbines bases have been completed out of 76. And obviously it's created a, a habitat management plan and about £50 million to community trust fund. Uh, we're working with RWE Energy on Clickanook Forest, where tree, tree clearance is nearing completion and site investigation is about to start. We're working with RWE Energy on Brecha West, Brecha Forest <coughs> West, where tree clearance has been completed, site investigation is underway, and uh, as part of the pre-construction. We're working uh, with, um, with Vattenfall on the Area D Nanta Moch option agreement. But we're also doing things at a smaller scale as well. So we have a small-scale hydro program, and we've already enabled five hydro schemes to go ahead on the managed estate uh, during the last year, and we're enabling a further 10 schemes this financial, financial year. So we have a team dedicated to working with developers on these schemes. <clears throat> but we want to take this a bit of a stage further, and um, one of the ideas that we're working at the moment is this idea of uh, a renewable energy area. Um, and um, the idea here, here is really that we know that um, obviously we have to put grid connections, or grid connections have to be put into many of these developments. What more can we do with those grid connections? Can we encourage more diverse energy production in those, uh, in, in those areas? So whether we're talking about solar or hydro or short rotation forestry, what more can we do in those areas uh, to get more, you know, if like, uh, get, use more of the capacity that there is available to us. Um, we also think it's an opportunity to bring other multiple benefits uh, into play. So for things like restoration of deep peat, better water management, flood alleviation. So we're looking for sort of, you know, win-wins in terms of extending the range of energy supply but other benefits that we can get from the investments that have been made in the, in the area. This is a bit of a figure which um, we've been working with renewable um, uh, UK Wales on um, in terms of explaining how this might work in practice. If you can't see the detail now, it is on the, in our stand downstairs um, and you know, it just brings to life really about how we might think of these kind of areas uh, in, in the future. And after this session um, I'm going to be signing uh, a, a memorandum of understanding with Vattenfall to explore these ideas in more detail initially at the Penicomoid area because that is the furthest uh, uh, advance. But as I say, we're trying to think of other ways of actually extending the concept of renewable energy uh, based on the investments already happened. Okay, I've got to really speed up now then. Okay, um, we've um, really um, revamped our planning uh, service um, uh, within NRW and credit to <coughs> colleagues in the in the audience from MNW who've, who've, who've done that. I'm not going to go through this in, in, in detail, but what we aim to offer are all those things, early engagement, uh, a risk-based uh, approach, a solutions-based approach to things. We, want to, we, we appreciate every project is slightly diff different, so we want to provide bespoke advice. We want to be very open in terms of our relationship. We're very happy to work across boundaries, um, whether you know, in, in the sea or on, on, on land and we want to respond within, with, within deadlines. As I said, we've revamped our service. Um, that has shown in terms of our, uh, our productivity and in terms of our performance as well. Uh, at the beginning of last year, we were only achieving about 70% of our responses on time. That's already up to 90% uh, due to the hard work that people have, 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 put, have put into to that. What we would like in, in return um, is 
a reasonable uh, time frame, a reasonable statutory time frame for, for response. Uh, just be clear about the aims of the scope of, of what we're talking about. Early engagement, undertake surveys and assessments together, uh, demonstrate to us how uh, development has taken our advice into account, and any update on, on project delays. Very similar with marine licensing. Uh, this is a function that we brought in from, uh, from Welsh Government. Um, we're very pleased to be working with a number of stakeholders uh, on our marine licensing services, Marine Energy Pembrokeshire, as the Welsh Ports, in terms of actually working um, with organisations with an, with, a, with an interest to be. Again, we want to you know, provide the best possible service that we, that, that we possibly can. We are working at the moment on uh, a system for marine licensing fees and again we're doing that in a very open way with with the sector so last couple of slides coming up so um, overall in terms of working with business we want to promote engagement and feedback from the sector and I think we've got some really good examples of that um, hydropower for instance where uh, it was a pretty hot issue about 18 months ago with a lot of conflicting views on that um, we've worked together with the hydropower sector in, a, in, in groups to actually work through these issues, to provide consistent guidance uh, and policies, but to listen to what our stakeholders have been telling us. So um, we want to work that in, in other areas as well. In terms of mem memorandum of understanding, we've already signed one with, uh, with the current state. Uh, I have one in, 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 in train with Re Renewables Wales. Um, and Renewables Wales is also represented on our energy delivery uh, programme. So uh, we're up for that. What would help us, as I said before earlier, more, uh, more visibility of pipeline of projects uh, and their implications, even if it's just a gleam in the eye at the moment, come and talk to us. Um, you know, we, I think we can help you avoid some of the, the big pitfalls there. I feel quite strongly about evidence. Um, in many cases, we're not identifying the evidence needs of projects early enough. Uh, so we're ending up with a situation that we have two sets of experts disagreeing about evidence you know I think we need a, you know, a more concerted approach to that a more joined up approach on that let's keep the channels of communication open and you know we're, we're, we're here to help um, and, and finally um, as, as um, uh, one of the speakers said uh, this morning I think um, as we move into the deployment state phase in, in Wales Penicamoyth, Gwintamor uh, possibly the, 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 the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. I think this has got a really good opportunity to put Wales on, uh, on the map. It is an essential component of managing our natural resources sustainable. We're interested in identifying multiple benefits which come out of this, not just the energy production, but also how can we improve the environment, reduce flooding, all kinds of benefits that can come of that, as well as the economic and, and, and the social. Wales is really well placed for this. We know, we know that. Um, we have a fantastic natural environment. We have fantastic opportunities here. We're part of Team, team Wales. We do, however, need a strategic and a spatial approach to all of this. Uh, some of the projects we're talking about have very big implications for the environment, but also implications for other similar projects. And I would encourage us to, to actually adopt a, a strategic approach to this so that we're all clear about the, the direction of, of travel and what needs to be Done, done here. We get it in terms of um, providing or trying to provide a stable environment for investment. No surprises. Uh, we will do what we can to that. Clearly, there's some factors outside our control, but we want to provide that. We understand that you have to go to your boards, pitch for uh, monies or banks to pitch for money and so on. We want to be part of that. And I'm, you know, I've made an offer on several occasions to actually talk directly to boards or investment boards on our role in uh, permitting, regulation, li uh, licensing, and, and so on. And we want to work with business. We want to find solutions together. Thank you, Emmett. Um, we've just had a slight rejig of the agenda. So we've got uh, Mark Coyer from Maybe Bridge. Uh, Mark heads up the renewables business, and uh, as most of you know, maybe Bridge are the leading supplier of uh, turbine towers. Over to you, Mark. Okay, that was an unexpected uh, little change in sequence. I noticed Mark on his feet there, getting ready to come to the forum, but um, not a problem. Can you hear me at the back okay, yeah? Okay. Um, here is a challenge in terms of my session. 
15 minutes, 24 slides, yeah? Can I do it without getting nudged? <laughs> okay, sure. let's fire on. Um, I'm gonna get this thing to work. Not that one. Right, uh, today I want to talk, sometimes quite controversially, about uh, maximizing the benefits of the supply chain to Wales. I'm gonna go through these slides pretty rapidly. David is gonna make them available, I believe, either via the website, Renewables UK, or Renewables Wales website. Firstly, about maybe Bridge. Well, I've been around for 166 years. Um, the largest UK-based supplier of onshore wind towers and T pylons. In fact, we're the only supplier of T pylons at the moment. Supplier of components to offshore. We're into everything. We're active members and supporters of Swan Bay Tidal Lagoon. I sit on the advisory board. And we fully participate in the Mid Wales Regeneration Working Group. We'll cover each of those in turn. Our facilities, a lot of you are aware of them. Um, they've been in the public domain for four or five years. 40 acre site, we've got 200 direct people. We have another 300 indirects. The indirects, just as important as the directs. Again, we'll come on to the benefits to Wales in terms of making sure that the employment benefit is maximized. We have the ambition to supply Tidal Lagoon where, where storage is in excess of 50 uh, onshore towers, direct access to motorways. Wales supply chain opportunities, and that's the purpose of, of the quick session I'm giving you at the moment. Some statistics, there won't be many, but UK Wind directly employs 18,500 people and growing, and a further 16,000 indirectly. So there is value in the sector. There's more than 70,000 jobs could be created over the next decade if we get on the front foot on all aspects of renewables, not just wind, but all aspects. I believe that the number could be significantly larger in Wales as a proportion per capita, per GDP. There's currently um, around 700 onshore wind and roughly 200 tidal jobs in Wales at the moment. And again, that's set to grow dramatically. So why not actually have a target somewhere in lumps of 10,000 jobs at a time? A lot of negative Tory press surrounding renewables, particularly wind, and I'm quite happy to see Eric signing off there. So Eric is gone, and uh, Amber Rudd seems at this early stage to actually have some good green credential, which is fantastic. She was actually due to come to see us in uh, Chepstow. Um, we'll try and hold her to that, but it's very nice to see the back end of uh, Mr Pickles, who has been the scourge of onshore wind, and I have to say he did one hell of a job. But um, Yep, uh, happy retirement for them. With the exception of parts of Scotland, um, the UK is not renewables ready. I was asked in one of the very early Tidal Lagoon meetings, and they picked on me because I've got a funny accent, despite the fact I've been in Wales for 30 years. They said, how come Scotland's got it so right? Go find out. So I was sent with my kit bag. Not only did I go to Scotland, but we went with our teams to Denmark. We went to Scandinavia, we went to places not trying to reinvent the wheel ourselves, to find out how do you get it right. And there's a couple of key messages came out. The single largest key message came out, and I rant on this one, is that government, industry, and academia were all on a single agenda. It was driven by Denmark, by the, Den by the Danish government. It was driven in Scotland by the Scottish Assembly. And I kept thinking to myself, there's got to be parallels in terms of where Wales doesn't have to reinvent itself. It's got all the natural resources, probably the best in Europe in terms of the size of country it has. It's now about maximizing those. A couple of things that did come out quite clearly was a, a key lack in engineering skills to be able to service renewables. An awareness in the business community, the business community had heard about it, heard the buzzwords, but weren't really up for it. And then the big message, which was when we looked at the physicals and numbers the UK cost base is about 20% more expensive than best in class in Europe or the rest of the world. That needs to be addressed one way or the other. But industry, government, academia, slowly but surely, it's, it's coming, it's coming together. And you can see it in terms of the publications coming out and the way that people are talking about it in Wales. We've recently taken on 29 apprentices and we want to put each of those apprentices through an NVQ in renewables. It doesn't exist, we're going to have to invent it. So, Wherever you are in academia out there, talk to us. We talk to the universities, but even at NVQ level, so we get the grassroots there. 
And should there be a national body to represent renewable manufacturers, I believe driven by Renewables UK, the strategy group I think met yesterday in London, there's 600 members of Renewables UK, but you look at Denmark and you look at some other areas, their membership is in thousands, so it's a good place to be in Renewables UK because this sector will grow and the membership will grow. Our requirements in terms of maybe bridge, I'm embarrassed to say we spend 70% of our purchase outside the UK because it doesn't exist in the UK. There's no flange suppliers, there's no ladder suppliers, there's paint suppliers. And when we look at a complete bomb breakdown, item by item, we're trying to develop the Welsh supply base. What do you need to do? Pretty straightforward. Be good at what you do in your own business. Demonstrate your qualifications. We put out tens of millions of pounds in order to do that. And we'll work with the Welsh supply chain. We'll work as tightly as we possibly can. In terms of just a further example, for every tower we make, there is £50,000 per tower, or in excess of £15 million a year at today's manufacturing rates, that we've got to buy in. Each wind tower can have up to 3,500 components. So when you see the empty shell, it's not an empty shell. It's up. You could live in the thing. They're absolutely fantastic. So we're looking for the Welsh uh, UK suppliers now. We've already started with WAG and we've started with um, Renewables UK to say, look, it's time to actually get the whole thing together. Break down just a quick graphic there in terms of what we're buying. Grating, ladders, brackets, door frames, stairs, lighting, ventilation, power, paint, ducting, you name it. We're in the market for it. I'm a little out of sequence here, but in terms of setting the pace and actually driving it, um, Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, I have a couple of slides on that. Um, the UK Tidal Lagoon industry is set to realise local and, and, and it benefits to everyone who wants to come along with it. And just one little metric, which I hope I think is right, for every 1% that swings to the UK, that's 10 million quid of the capital value ends up in a UK business somewhere. So it's big, big numbers. The difficulties for real, I know as part of the advisory group that um, what Mark and his team are about is trying to encourage and develop a UK-based industry. It would be so easy just to go to the, the established suppliers and say, bring in your suppliers from Portugal, from Brazil, from the Far East. They're not doing that. They're working with the government, industry, academia, working together to deliver that key project. The strike price hopefully will give Tidal Lagoon, the chance to be able to afford to support in some way that 20% excess that does exist. But the common factor, we'll have a common um, form of contract through, we need to learn quickly. Awakening the Dragon is uh, something that I sort of coined going back 18 months uh, to one of the groups and saying, look, th there is so much opportunity in Wales with natural resource. It's now started, the dragon's starting to wake up and realise how it can actually be a huge player, not just in the UK, but in Europe. Industry, academia, government, all come together in the Mid Wales Group. And the Mid Wales Group have got a simple task. And the simple task is how can you actually create jobs and how can you, in a, an area of natural beauty, maximise the GDP coming out of there? You're not going to get another control technique. You're not going to get another Laura Ashley. And as I've said in many, many times before, the M54, had it gone to Dublin, we wouldn't be having this argument, debate about how do you re-energise Mid Wales, because it stops at Telford, the M54, and look at the energy and, and industry around Telford. Imagine it had gone another 40 miles into Wales, then powers would certainly be, uh, the, the, its, its ability to generate income would be phenomenal. So what has that Welsh group been doing? Uh, there's 30 businesses from a, a, around the whole of Wales and further afield, there's frequent uh, uh, visitors come down from Scotland, come from other parts of England, to try and, and, and make sure that whatever we're doing in Mid Wales is successful. We've seen it before in Denmark in our visits in Scotland and in Port Talbot, the steelworks, where close to the Tidal Lagoon is going to be. Before the steelworks ever got there in Port Talbot, Land Werner, or anywhere else, what got there first was the subcontractors' compounds, all the supply base to be able to sustain the industry. And that's going to happen again. A little political uh, shout from me on this. I cannot understand why feed-in tariffs and rocks or contracts for differences that there is only one system. In other words, 
We I see government money going in to support projects. By all means, if you want to bring in towers from the Far East, fantastic. But you ain't going to get full support from the government because that is political money that we earn, that we pay into the government. And I believe there should be a two-speed system. And I am politically active in doing that. And I know that the whole emphasis behind Swansea Tidal Lagoon looking at 50% um, or 65% UK content can get supported by the government with a higher strike price. It's one and the same. So there needs to be a few ways that we look at trying to sophisticate this part of the business. And so to the future, where will we be by 2020? Scenario one, we fail to embrace the opportunity. Welsh, English and UK content and offshore tidal and onshore wind doesn't get above 20%. We've got another London array debate, which you can argue the numbers, 5% or 8% UK content, miserable failure. Or scenario two, industry, government, academia, and just looking at some of the faces around here, you're all represented here, get the act together. 20% becomes 60%, hundreds of thousands of new jobs created in the UK, tens of thousands in Wales. That dragon's starting to wake up, yeah? Scenario two, in terms of developing that further, Devo Max is coming to Wales, and Wales very shortly will be able to deliver self-determined projects above 350 megawatt. Fantastic. Welsh targets for energy, renewables, I haven't seen any. I know, and I'm not a supporter of the SNP, but I understand what they're doing. They've got a target of 100% renewable energy in Scotland by 2020, and ironically, 300% by 2030. I haven't seen a target that actually says somewhere between the 7.9% in Wales right now. Where is it going? Because that's where government starts saying, OK, let's set ambitious targets. Industry, academia, get in behind it, get on that single agenda. How many jobs will it support? Thousands. So, quick summary. Wales has, has stated its desire, which I think is fantastic, to be a, a, a leading renewable hub in the EU. Great positioning. Building a local Welsh supply chain is a must. We'll have an open day at maybe Bridge. It will invite as many people that is possible to come and participate and look at saying, we can make that, we can make that, we can make that. Um, the benefits run across the whole of Wales and further into um, uh, to, to the UK. Um, it's important to get the targets in 2020, 2030, 2040 beyond, so at least you know what you're dealing with. We're also advocating very strongly two renewable manufacturing hubs in Wales. One onshore in Powys, no reason why not. Again, some research by Renewables UK suggested for each large wind tower, there is 1.9 permanent jobs associated with it in terms of maintenance, etc. So, you have to concede that at some stage, perhaps some more onshore wind would not be a bad thing for Powys, for its GDP, etc. And obviously, whatever Tidal Lagoon's final um, turbine assembly plant is, there, that's where we should have the, the contractors compound, all the sub-manufacturing base in order to support that primary industry. Um, I also believe further that the creation of, uh, within Renewables Cymru, uh, assisted by Welsh Assembly Government, is the creation of Warham, which is a Welsh Association of Renewable Manufacturers. So the 600 members, they can be a large, powerful group within Wales as a subgroup of Renewables UK. And I hope I'm not standing on anyone's toes by saying that. Um, that's all. Now, did I beat the 15 minutes? You did. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. You've uh, got slightly back on track now for our final speaker of uh, this afternoon's session, uh, Mark Shorrock. Mark is the Chief Executive of Tidal Lagoon Power. Uh, Mark's been an innovator and entrepreneur for more than 10 years in various uh, renewables industries. Over to you, Mark. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going I'm to sort of have a little look at where we are on Swansea. It's a uh, it's a nerve-wracking time. The uh, government have to make the planning decision on or before the June the 10th, so uh, sort of on a 19-day, 20-day countdown now. Um, so, so the uh, Mark and I, have, you've heard Mark talk now, Emir and I have had conversations that where is such an opportunity here? We, we, if you just put in Swansea, you will give birth to a tidal lagoon industry here, and you can put 3,000 megawatts between Cardiff and Newport, and you can put another 2,000 between Newport and the bridge, and you can put another 2,500 between 
uh, Colwood Bay going across to Prestatyn and Rill. And, and as Mark knows, and Mark talked about a bit there, we're, we're going great guns. We, we have a 310 million pound turbine and generator order. Um, 185 million of that so far has been spent in the UK. Um, heavy fab assembly is coming here into Wales. The, the full assembly plant's coming in here at the Wales. And once we've put our root system in, we can do all the lagoons from it. Um, so that, that's our vision. Our vision is that here's, here's the tide time. Three o'clock in the morning, it's high tide in Swansea. 7.50 in the morning in Colwyn, it's high tide. Um, that means you can do virtually 24-hour generation between the Colwyn and, 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 the, and the Swansea lagoons, because one's generating when the other one's off, the other one's generating when the other one's off. Um, but look at the, uh, the, the, the opportunity for Wales. Most of the great sites are off the Welsh coast. Um, the, the, the seabed is flat, the tidal range is just ludicrous, uh, and, and it, it's got nowhere to go, so it goes up and up and up the water when it comes in off the um, Atlantic Ocean. And, and, and then, you know, if, we if I take it all the way into the future, we've got a team working in northern France now. The French invented tidal lagoons, they did La Rance in 1966, uh, and, um, uh, and they never went to do their big lagoons. So why can't we become exporters in Wales back to the French? And, like, and, and um, I think we'll be doing that when, when the first of the foreign ones. Um, just, to, just to explain it, the Coriolis effect means that the right hand, so northern France, and the right hand of, of, of where the water's going is where you get the big tides. And that's the, the, the time in the day is the red, and, and, and sorry, the, the, um, and, the, and the blue is the tidal range. I don't know what this ceiling is, it means to be about four or five meters. Swansea Bay, 10 meters of height, and 11 and a half square kilometers of water. So the, 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 the sheer colossal amount of power that you get from that water coming and going from our bathtubs that we build in the sea it, it, it is, is, is just quite something. Swansea Bay, uh, five Olympic swimming pools worth of water every second going out through the turbines. Uh, and we don't do anything, it's just nature, the little dance between the, 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 the moon and the earth. Um, so, so, so here we are, the seven, this is our project. Um, it's high tide here in the lagoon and it's high tide out here in the sea. But the, the phenomenal thing, I've just, just started to do these press trips now. We went out, we went out here yesterday, this is the little pontoon just on the other side of the Tally Barrage. And it's like little steps, steps like this. And in the one hour that we were out doing press trips around here, 15 of those steps appeared. And, and it, just, it, it just drops. And so after three hours, you, en you end up with, with the, the, the difference in height, four and a half meters. And you haven't done anything, you just waited for three hours and suddenly there's the height of the, uh, of the water outside in the ocean, here's the height of what we have in the lagoon, and you just let the potential go. And so we, so we generate electricity on a kind of three to three and a half hour phase. We wait for three hours to let the water out, and then we generate again as the light tidal lagoon fills back up again. Um, entirely predictable. If anybody wants to nominate a date in the future, we'll be able to tell you what time of day we'll generate. We'll generate four times a day. And um, the, 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 the kind of in incredible thing is that is the longevity. This, this breakwater here, designed for 500 year storms, designed to uh, last 120 years. Um, the, 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 the turbines themselves, I'll show some pictures in a second, but marinized bolt turbines in the sea in France, been operational now for 49 years. And, um, they only replaced five blades out of the 24 turbines when they did a retrofit last year. Um, 170 odd thousand homes we've worked. What's, what's incredible, I suppose the innovation is worth, worth mentioning that, that, that we now lead with is this body of water, when the manufacturers first looked at it, they said you could make 410 gigawatt hours of power out of it. We've now got it up to 545,000 uh, megawatt hours of power, 545 gig, uh, as a guaranteed minimum with 40 million pounds worth of penalties in the contract behind it. Um, this is my little side just showing the, the difference in water between the, the one and the other. That's our sailing and boating centre. We've, we've wanted to make sure that this is a power station that's also an amenity, an amenity not just for Swansea Uni and, and Swansea Met around the corner, but for the whole of Swansea, the whole of Wales and internationally. So the National Triathlon body has said, can they come and run international events here? The, um, the Extreme 40 sailing competition, could they come and run, run um, tournaments in, 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 in the bay. So, so we, we hope that these, this little snapshot here 
gives a sense of what, what a tunnel again becomes. And uh, Emily and I have had conversations a lot about, you know, we want this to be a natural, uh, a natural lagoon, a sort of a positive for, for the environment. The salt marsh creation, there's a reintroduction of the oysters. I, I, I was always struck, I first went to Swansea as a boy, we, you know, I went to see Grimorgan against Somerset cricket. But, but, uh, but I had no sort of sense of when I came back to see this sort of faded board in Oyster Mouth saying that in the 1870s, 12,500 12, tons of oysters were harvested that year. And, and most years there was 10,000 plus tons of oysters. So the oyster spats are there in the bay, but they get washed out, we overfished them, then they got killed off by a big, a big winter in the 1930s. So we, we have an ambition to take the oyster numbers up to thousands of tons again. Um, and, and some people hate and some people love the idea of having a big sculpture in the sea, but, but why not have a big sculpture in the sea that people want to come and visit and, and, and see something that appears and disappears with this amazing 10 metre rise and fall of the tide. Um, so so that's, that, that's what we're working towards. Um, four, four giant lagoons around the UK coast, two in, two in, two then in English waters. Um, so this is, this is what's going to get built. It's going to be a sucking of sand, locally one in the sea, and then, and, and then we're building, building it into um, great, 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 great big um, mounds in the sea. Now, I, I didn't know these slides were coming up, but it's really fascinating. Here we go, look. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, each one of these lines is, is, is the, the four big power stations that come off of Swansea. Swansea can happen, these all kind of happen for themselves. Uh, Gordon talked a bit, a bit about it earlier on, but and I like that stat graph presentation from that bloke when you and I were in Westminster last week. The stat graph guy came in and he said, we're really interested in the UK because the UK needs 80 gigawatts of power and it's only got an interconnect to France for two gigawatts and it's only got an interconnect to the Netherlands for one gigawatt and it's thinking about little tiny interconnects with Norway and Iceland. Um, so if you're 80 gigawatts, you guys are losing 30 gigawatts in power stations that are going offline forever, us, Mouth, Aberthaw, Didcot. Uh, Hartlepool, Haitian, some of the needs. Um, so we need to replace that power, and fundamentally, I think we all in this room think if you can get to 100 quid per megawatt hour, then you, you're comparable with nuclear and gas, and renewables is not having to kind of compete. We're, 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 the, we're the mainstream. This, this is a chart that we've put to government, we've put to the Climate Change Commission. The average strike price that will be required across those four lagoons is about 110 pounds. Um, but what you see is you get, you get a profile where they start to blend over when they're generating, and you start to get quite a heavy amount of a base load from renewables running across the top for the little, little peaks that we've got, to, we've got to fill in. But we're starting, when we, when we play with this, you get to 21 or 22 hours out of 24 from, from the tides around our country. Um, I, added, I added Jersey into that one, because if you add just one in the Channel Islands, you start to fill the gap up. Okay, the big mission, uh, and one that we're going to have to work really hard with Pete and with Emir and the colleagues at Natural Resources Wales on. This is, this is RSPB's vision, it's not our own. But if you, if you build big, big tidal lagoons, um, you, you've got the opportunity to also create really, really lovely habitats. So all of the gunk from the tunnels in Crossrail gets dumped here on this below sea level patch of land in Essex. And they're using the, 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 the bores, tunnels, spoils to go here and then creating 655 hectares of, of new salt marsh, tidal creeks uh, and, and, and wetlands. And, and what we see that you can do with the big lagoons is you can start to put islands such as this within the lagoon. And indeed, you put your flood protection barrier at the front of the lagoon and you build creeks out the back. You get away, you get rid of the kind of flood protection walls at the back and you, you create much more na native natural habitats. We, we have an ambition to create 25,000 acres of new natural habitat with, the, um, with, with our seven estuary proposals. Um, so we want our, our lagoons to be good for people, good for planet, and good, good for nature. The, uh, this is Cardiff, just to give you a sense of where we go next. Um, so uh, Swansea has to happen. Swansea doesn't happen, this doesn't happen. Um, but just to give you a sense of what's possible with lagoons. This is to scale. This is a Swansea tidal lagoon. Jack Bramford has died, and one Swansea is half of the whole wall length of Cardiff. So with only two wall lengths of Cardiff, of, of Swansea, we get a Cardiff. And you see you then get much, much greater surface area. But in, but in terms of the, oh, hang on, didn't go, let me go to that. I want to go there first. The, 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 
Great Wall of Pisa are the same. In fact, the, the wave height that you design for in Cardiff is, is, is less. Um, the, the turbine house is pretty much the same as Swansea. And these are even the points we've been saying to government. You've got to look after Swansea. But we've proved all the lagoons once you've done the first one. Um, this is a sense of the different quantities. But to scale, again, of the quarry run armor rock and sediment infill you need on the Cardiff one from Swansea. But that, that's the dramatic picture for me. That's why you make cheap power with big lagoons. Because your volumes of water are just immense. Um, go, go, go back to Colwyn just for a second. The, the, you know, there's a, th this is just to show the search area. And you can see the shape of the sea here. In, this is where 20 people died in 1984 with the flood. And you, it's a search for any, sh any series of shapes of lagoons across the North Wales coast. Um, and, and, and it's very kind to us, the North Wales coast, in terms of its, its geography. Um, OK, these are our milestones. Um, so we're trying to give birth to an industry. To do that, we've got to try and give birth to Swansea. Um, we get our planning, we hope, by the June the 10th. Um, we, 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 we then uh, work really hard with, with EMEA's marine licensing team. Uh, we we're hopeful of a, of a marine license uh, on, on or around, but about a month after the, 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 the planning. And, and, and then it's with government, so if you do have Ms. Rudd coming to visit you, you know, we, 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 it's all systems go, really, in terms of the government to say, if we want to start on site next March, and the marine season is really key, if I, if I take you all the way back to the, 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 the lagoon shape, well, it's not the present one, I'll just show you on this one. This wall coming out of Swansea has to be built in the first marine season. It's, um, it, it's a four-month build, but with two months then of weather delay built into it. Uh, uh, and so we... we we must start in March if we want to have total, complete buffers to get our umbilical cord out to our turbine house in the sea in time. So you really count back. If you want to mobilise in March, you have to reach financial close in December. To reach financial close in December, you've got to get your bank offers and, and credit. But credit. The banks have to get a credit in September. So, we, so that's, that's it. It's all, it's all now down to the next 90 days, really. If in the next 90 days we can do, do, do all the bits, the little components, we'll have a project to build. Um, we wanted somebody else to give us some stats. So these are the stats for, for the world, for the kind of UK jobs. Um, and, and, and Mark and Nick Ravel and, 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 and Roger Evans and, and, and this, this gang of people have just been fantastic. So, so between us all, we've gone out and we've talked to the UK supply chain and we've said, what can you do? Uh, and, and can you make the shafts and can you make the, can you make the blades? Oh, I'll take the shaft and blade cycle here. No, hang on, sorry. No. Two minutes on. Two minutes, that's fine, David. I've only got these guys to go. Um, well, I was hoping to show you a turbine size. So I'm going to go back to the way the turbines is because we can finish with that anyhow. So that one will do. So where we got to is this blade in the turbine has been made in the UK. So this shaft, these blades, they've been made in the UK. This bulb cone has been made in the UK. All the generators inside has been made in the UK. All of the steel work that you see here has been made in the UK. The glass tube line has all been made in the UK. Um, some of it's in Wales, some of it's in England. It's all been assembled here in, 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 in the two facilities. And um, we're, we, we think, I, I did the numbers last night for coming today, we think we're at 74%, which I think is not, not, not bad for the first one. Um, as Mark says, it, it, we, we still need them to give us the strike price that we've asked for. If, if we get, if we get nipped, and nipped on, the, on, the, on the strike price, we, 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 we took a view ourselves that we were going to be prepared to have 20 million pounds more expensive turbines. So, so you could go, you take that 310 million I quoted earlier, um, down to 290. Now clearly Mark and I have been working hard to try and see if we can get the UK manufacturers to get that 10, 20% out of their pricing. But um, you know, no, no, we're, we're in good place. I, I will finish that one slide, David, just, just because I, I think with, with, with Emmy here, with colleagues from NRW here, sorry this is such small print, but these are all of the intertidal and subtidal and deep transects and water quality uh, and over, overflights and bird monitoring that we then now do over the next 10 years um, for our environmental monitoring. We're, we're quite proud of our adaptive environmental monitoring program. Uh, colleagues at NRW have been working hard with us to give us their feedback to try and make it blue ribbon. The, the RSPB came out and were really bold and they said, we're only going to support future lagoons if you do a fantastic environmental monitoring and mitigation program. We don't think we move the sands or the silts. We don't think we'll affect the birds, but we're going to be really monitoring to make sure we don't. Thank you very much for your listening.
Thank you, Mark, and thanks to all our speakers for really interesting uh, presentations. Um, we're run, running a little late, but I think there's going to be some questions in the room, so I'd like to take the full 15 minutes here until David Club kicks us out. So, questions really from the floor to our panel. And can you just state your name and uh, where you're from, please? Anyone? <laughs> yes. Yeah, better shout. I don't know if there's any mics around, I'm sorry. It hasn't. Uh, when will we announce it? Um, I, I guess in the next sort of week. I guess. I mean, in, in, our, in our office, there's 52 new people appeared in the last two weeks, and, and quite a few of them are the civils contractor. So. Um, I, I couldn't couldn't tell you until we announce it. Uh, we, we've, we've made our appointment, so we just, we just need to tell everybody that we've made the appointment, which is basically signing contracts. We hope to sign contracts next week, so once contracts are signed, we'll announce it. Thank you. Next, next question. In the middle there, please. No, it's not sorted. I'm probably guilty of, of uh, I'll apologise to David. I, I, w we have put what we think is a very, very strong tender into the Crown Estate. The Crown Estate are, are, are following a, a process, yeah. um, and that process it gives an expectation that I think it's next week uh, that we would hear if we had, had, had put in an invitation to tender that was deemed to be of sufficient quality that the Crown Estate would like to pursue it to, with a view to get into an agreement for lease. So. We, we're following the process that the Crown Estate has set, um, and, and you know, it's, it, they've got a good tender from us, so hopefully next week we'll hear from them. Nothing to add from me. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a, do you know, it's a good question, and, and I'm, I've got a nice answer to give as well, which is that um, we have just started a, a search for a female non-executive board director, because we recognise that we don't have gender diversity on our board, but we've got some, we've got my old schoolmate and me from, from as, as, the, as the sort of two old buddies, uh, and then it's grown with two male representatives of our funders and a male civil engineering background board, but yet... We're, we're addressing it. We're, we're aware of it. Um, I'll ask a question while you're thinking. Um, Emma, you mentioned uh, earlier, you said you're trying to create a stable environment for investment. And perhaps if you want to comment on, on that and, and Gordon as well, on the, on the, the stable environment for policy and for, for regulation around some of the projects that the two marks have spoken of. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think we all recognise that there's a lot of uncertainty in the processes. You know, we've met with Mark on... On, on his project and, and others. Um, what we want to do is to make that process as, as easy as, as, as possible and a, on a no surprises basis. So you know, being very upfront, being very transparent on, on what we do. Um, when you know, international investment uh, and boards are involved, um, they have different regimes in, in, in different countries. So you know, they, don't, they don't necessarily understand if that relates to contracts that we work in. So you know we're open to, to actually you know, uh, going to meet those boards and explaining what our role is on that. Uh, the more certainty we can give in terms of timelines to, to this project, yours being very clear on what we what we expect, you know, uh, monitoring plans, all the rest of it. Um, you know, this is this is being done. You know, this is this is being done. It, it, but it needs us to sit down with the developers, with project sponsors, uh, to you know, to sort that out early doors. But uh, no, we understand that you know, because of the pricing and you know, all the rest of it, you know, we want to make that our side of the the, uh, the investment as, as, as easy as possible. Gordon, I think when it comes to stability in the EMR regime, one of the problems we've got at the minute is um, there is an awful lot of flexibility uh, in the CFD process and indeed the capacity market as well for the Secretary of State to basically do what the damn well they please up to two weeks before the opening of an allocation round, the Secretary of State can turn around and say, you know what, I'm really not going to bother at all. They could stop it. They could 
you know, decide not to give contracts to one technology, they could completely change the budget. There is a huge amount of flexibility in there. Now, on the one hand, flexibility can be quite good. Um, but on the other hand, a, a really vastly unfettered flexibility and not much track record as to how that flexibility is used can, can give you quite a lot of nervousness. Uh, and I'm kind of worried at the minute, obviously a bit of a curveball at the minute, that those powers could be quite easily used to you know, do away with some of the technologies that we'd obviously very much support. So um, it may be over time and it beds in and there is kind of customer practice and you know, okay, well, these powers still exist, but frankly, we don't expect them ever to be used. That kind of stuff might go away. But as it stands, a change of government in the midst of the first, you know, the, the second allocation round process kicking off is making you pretty nervous all round. Um, and I'm kind of waiting for it to settle down so we can start getting a sense of how the current government will use its powers over the next five years and then how that sets an example for future governments to, to continue to use them. Thank you. More questions? Graham. Oh, certainly. It's just that when you've got to talk big lumps of cash, which is what offshore wind needs, then if you have lots of threats to the budget, um, it's the one that's going to feel it first. Now, um, obviously, what I've just mentioned in terms of uh, flexibility with the Secretary of State to do what it damn well he or she pleases um, is a threat potentially to, to anyone if, if he or she wants to, to, to threaten them. Uh, and on the other hand... Um, you've got issues around um, if, if the cheaper technologies like onshore wind are obstructed and you try and do it all with kind of pot two, less established type technology, you will, you will bust the budget. You have to have some of those le lesser ones in the mix. So um, in that way, the, the budget starts becoming uh, an ally rather than a threat. Um, but it's, it's in no way... Uh, it, the budget is less threatening to the cheaper technologies because you can use as much less money. Whereas something like, you know, if you're talking about needing 300 million plus in a round for offshore wind and there's only, you know, 400 million left in the budget, then you start getting extremely nervous. Thank you. Question in the front. Is your question specifically Welsh content? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I can't answer it accurately yet in so far as there's no forge or foundry on the turbines. There's only one forge in the whole country at Sheffield Forge Masters no, that can cope. A development phase. A development phase. So we've, we've spent 25 million to date and you know, it's, it's basically being spent from, from, from a d diversity, but it's, you know, there was, yes, there's a big chance being spent in Oxford, there's a big chance, loads of it being spent in Cardiff, Swansea. I, it's pretty much a Welsh, it's a, it's a Welsh slash English spend with a Welsh bias, but I, to break it, break it down off the top of my head, I couldn't do it. It's, it's been, you know, a sort of concentric circle around Swansea and a concentric circle around our office in Gloucester where we could do it, between those two, between those two offices, basically. Thank you. And further questions? Lady in front. Yes, um, so um, I had a question for um, Mr. Kenny. He mentioned a key strength of challenge for the new government going forward. Um, given the vast level of audits that you did with the strength of challenge and certainly onshore wind in about 2005 and Plan 8 that didn't quite deliver, um, I saw the numbers say once again, 58,000 in the coming 12 years, where do you see that strategic approach? 
Okay. Um, I think the principle behind Tan 8 was absolutely right. It was deeply flawed, but actually, in terms of actually identifying areas that are particularly suitable for you know, onshore wind, I think it was the right approach, and it enabled well, the Forestry Commission at the time, but you know, uh, uh, other developers to actually focus on those areas and actually look at them. Now, obviously, lots have gone wrong or slowed down in terms of the delivery of that, principally for, for planning reasons, but that approach to actually saying, these are, you know, uh, these are uh, the best opportunities for, for onshore in particular, but, but, but other forms of energy, is, is the right one, I think, because I think that helps the developers, certainly helps you know, regulators like ourselves to actually focus on that. So, yeah, deeply flawed, but I think the concept was right. Um, I think the point I was trying to make was that, um, you know, we're, we're talking, I mean, Mark, you know, illustrated some of his you know, um, potential projects looking forward, but if you just take the Seven Estuary, for instance, as, a, uh, as an example, um, absolutely fantastic opportunity, the, you know, the tidal range and all the rest of it there, but huge environmental constraints, issues to, to, to be confronted there. Um, and we need to actually look at, you know, what is the best mix, what is the next pattern spatially, um, for um, for development in in that area, and I think you have to do that on a on a, on a large scale scale spatial basis, and then you can drill down into into the individual sites. So um, you, I think we need we need that. Otherwise, I think there's a real danger of getting off with just you know individual projects, which probably don't maximise the energy potential of the areas, um, but certainly uh, might you know prevent other developments from happening as as, as well. So Yeah, no, I think that's a fair comment, I think. Um, well, I think, first of all, you've got to get the right, you know, the, the right organisation, the right people in the room to do that. But you're right, I think the, 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 the follow-through has to be there as well in terms of co commitment. So um, whether it's, you, you know, whether it's uh, ourselves, whether it's National Grid, whether it's um, the planning authorities and all the rest of it, they need to be in the room, I think, in, in, in part of that strategic assessment going, going forward and commit to actually following through on that, on, on that basis. And certainly from our part... We would we would very much want want to do that. I think we've got more of a chance of doing that in Wales, because under the Welsh government, um, you know, we have control over a lot of a, a lot of this. But I think uh, I think if we are really going to make a difference here, and as I say, maximise all the all the benefits from from, from, from this, we need that sort of that 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 joined up approach. Thank you. Just bring other other panelists in, Gordon. And yeah, I just wanted to come on that from our experience of Town Eight. Um, one of the problems with that kind of strategic approach is it, it's kind of the perfect being the enemy of the good. You end up spending five years dicking around making the plan, in which time nobody can do anything. Uh, and you end up, as well with Tan A, potentially, you might end up with choosing a bunch of areas which actually aren't that very suitable, um, which is what happened with Tan 8. So in the meantime, you could have had developers going out, scouting the right sites. They're not stupid. They know where good sites are and what are developable sites. Uh, uh, and they could have just gotten on with it, and which is the, the principle we've defended in, in the rest of the UK, uh, that developer-led planning actually pragmatically lets you get on with it. So I understand why people like the idea of spatial planning and strategic planning, but if you just want to get on and do with something, then it may get in the way when you need to deliver stuff in the short term. Anything to add, Mark or Mark? <laughs> What I'd say is we, we are, we're working on an environmental enhancement project. So the blueprint for the wetland and, and, and wildlife habitat creation alongside the lagoons, at the moment we're taking a role of talking to NRW, talking to the EEA, talking to the Wildlife Trust, talking to the Natural Nature Reserve, managers, reserve wardens, southwest heads, Welsh heads. Uh, and you know we've reached a conclusion we're going to have to lead it, that, 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 that kind of whole ecosystems approach that we want to pioneer. Uh, we're going to work really closely with, 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 with EMEA's group, but we we find there isn't there isn't a sort of body who can lead and drive something, and so so we we've ended up trying to co-opt all of the nature bodies, statutory <coughs> and non-statutory, in, into into one move forward, forming our own um, brains trust, if you will, uh, you know, peer peer review processes internally. Okay. 
Thank you. One final question, I think, if we've got time for. Yes, lady in front. Comment on that? Uh, I think it's brilliant. The only the only limiting factor is, is, is the national grid because at the moment you can't the, the, the you know the valleys project for the hydro can't even get a twenty kilowatt connection. And I'd perhaps add to that. I mean, I think it's going to be part of the answer, but the trouble is our requirement for, for renewables and energy in general is so large. There's got to be large commercial development as well. Absolutely. So just a reminder to everyone, the um, MOU will be signed between NRW and Vattenfall on the renewable energy areas downstairs in the refreshment area now. And if you'd just like to thank our four panellists. Thank you very much. <laughs>